So joined today by Martin Bronco, who is a uh, serial entrepreneur in technology and more specifically deep tech, but also a former minister, uh, uh, deeply involved in European affairs, uh, and now uh, looking at what's new in biotech is actually what's old in biotech. Is that what you found? It's not necessarily the, 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 the most recent discovery that's the most valuable or interesting? Yeah, actually, that's kind of been my experience lately, right? I'm working on a project now or a company uh, that is technically commercializing a biotech biotechnology, which is pretty old, but I found it really amazing and exciting because actually it's, by pretty old, I mean 20 years, right? So in biotech, this, this is sort of ages, but turns out this has a potential to basically address about or, or, or cure most of the tumors that currently account for more than 50% of all cancer deaths, right? So, but nobody's been really sort of pushing into the fore lately because kind of people have felt like, well, it's an old technology. So what can be exciting about it? So how, how do people ignore a technology for so long? So, so this is interesting, right? So I think in biotech, two things happen. So first one, I mean, everybody just jumps on kind of the latest fashion or, or many, many funds and many investors they just tend to jump on the latest fashion. So, you know, if it's the CAR T cells, you know, you need to be doing CAR T cells, right? It needs to be two, three years old. Like in this case, this is a technology, as I said, discovered 20 years ago. And um, basically what happened was that there was even um, um, a company that tried to commercialize it. Uh, and they went through phase three clinical trials, uh, basically trying to develop this cancer drug and they failed, right? So the conclusion of all the you know, investors, uh, and particularly those who look at it now, goes like, well, I mean, there was somebody who seven years ago went through phase three, they failed, so this is clearly not working. Actually, what turns out to be, to happen was that, A, it was a badly designed clinical trial, so there was, and even the company then admitted later that, yeah, we made some serious, prob you know, mistakes in the design, and B, uh, they, there are some technologies and knowledge that has been developed over the past 10 years with regard to this specific technology, which wasn't available then, right? So you can actually now really bring it to the next level. Uh, but again, you know, we've been for a while struggling trying to convince even investors that this makes sense because they all felt this is kind of old. Finally, we found some really visionary top, top investors, I mean, top European biotech who actually get it, but it took time. So there is a confluence of a technology that sort of made it to this level but there's an element of this, the, the other tech coming along and supporting it? Exactly, right? So for example, so maybe I'll just tell you first what the technology is, right? So basically we're developing an uh, immunotherapy for cancer uh, based where the target is so-called carbonic anhydrase 9 or CA9. So CA9 is this protein and it's basically, uh, you can only find it in hypoxic cells. And it turns out that basically, for all practical purposes, the only hypoxic cells where this can be found is very aggressive tumors. So tumors that have hypoxia, i.e. you know, pathologically low level of oxygen. And this, this protein is instrumental in, you know, in the survival of these, of these uh, cells, right? Of these, of these hypoxic cells. Uh, so effectively, the, the immunotherapy we're doing is we're using it as a target, right? So we have developed a couple of uh, monoclonal antibodies that are specifically targeting this CA9, uh, which is on the surface of these tumor, hypoxic tumor cells. Uh, and then basically what happens is, A, they kind of disrupt the metabolism of the tumor cells. So the tumor cells on themselves start having issues, you know, kind of survival issues. But the second thing is also, you know, as they mess up, so to speak, the met metabolism of these tumor cells, they also attract uh, NK cells, so natural killer cells, i.e., you know, basically your immune system cells to go after these, uh, these tumors, uh, uh, after these tumor cells. Um, but again, um, you know, the CNN has been around. It was discovered more than 20 years ago. So uh, in that sense, it's a not, not a new technology now. What is new is that, incidentally, so there's a lot more interesting and deep knowledge around hypoxia and the role of hypoxia in tumors. In fact, the Nobel Prize for Medicine two years ago was uh, given to um, a team of people that have uh, worked on hypoxia. 
And actually, we, some of the people that have worked very deeply with this team uh, are on our team in, in, you know, in, in our company. So that's one thing. And the second thing is diagnostics. So we now have much better diagnostic technology. So we can be constantly monitoring patients for the level of these CA9 and hypoxia in their tumors. So it gives you a, you know, a much better picture constantly of you know, how this is involving in the patient and who are the right patients. And then the final technology is just big data, sort of you know, AI big data, uh, uh, you know, number crunching, where we can now actually build fairly sophisticated models of you know, who are the right patients to target, like for a truly personalized therapy. Because what happened with this company was that they did a trial where they kind of brought in anybody who had any level of CA9, uh, you know, showing any level of rather, CA9. Rather than targeting specific uh, patients at a specific level. So it seems like, I mean, what, what this is, is a combination of a technology then supported by, you know, computing. I don't know if you were using AI at all. Or, yeah, exactly, or other, exactly. Other data techniques that might not have been around when that study Absolutely. was done, allowing us to leverage that and it's sort of a, a fourth industrial revolution kind of story where exactly. you have a, a confluence of things that take something that is older but make it new again. Yeah, yeah. So actually what happened in the failed trial was that, and this was just one of the mistakes, but you know, they took a very broad population of people and, and tested, is this gonna work on average for all of them, right? Uh, and on average, it didn't really work. But once an analysis was done post facto, what we, people with you know very high levels of this of this marker of this target, uh, they found out, oh my God, this is actually working really really well. Uh, like it worked for them, but they failed to reach the target, you know, the primary target in the clinical trial. So the, you know, in a sense, the clinical trial failed. And you know, once you start putting a, you know tens of millions, let alone hundreds of millions, into a, a program, and it fails. You know, you can come and reinterpret, re but it's very hard to convince your investors. Well, you know, let's let's start over. Uh, we succeeded, we but mistake, in a different way. In a different way, but now we know that they, in fact, they've succeeded in showing that this works, but under certain conditions and scenario, and there are also and there are some technologies required to ascertain that these you know these conditions and criteria are present, and effectively what it boils down to is is finding the right patient. So. You don't go broadly, but you really try to target much more specifically those patients where it's extremely likely to work. So what are the lessons that take out, you can take out of that more broadly for looking at biotech companies in general? Um, what are the lessons? So, I mean, for me, the interesting lesson is that, you know, all that doesn't necessarily mean uh, you know, not interesting uh, or dysfunctional or unattractive. I think another lesson is, and particularly it, it means that because, you know, biotech is moving so fast and there's just any new emerging technologies, there's so much that we just don't know about it yet, right? Or, or like so much background knowledge that we still don't have, which, you know, might emerge as, as happened here over the, the next 20 years. There was just so much more knowledge that suddenly you realize, oh my God, like, you know, this is, you know, like we can do some pretty amazing stuff in here, right? So it's sort of like, you know, maybe go to basic physics, nuclear forces, right? You know, people understood nuclear forces way before they started building uh, nuclear power plants, you know, let alone nuclear bombs. But, um, you know, it, it just took a while because there was other knowledge, engineering knowledge, et cetera, that needed to be there for the fundamental, this, this fundamental discovery and understanding to be actually, for someone to be able to convert it into something useful. Shift of uh, uh, pace entirely. Uh, one of the things you've been very passionate about is going out to discover, find uh, breakthrough technologies that, and bringing them from the lab to having real world impact on, on, on people's lives and, and, and uh, stopping climate change. Uh, do you think that the world of Zoom work and the Zoom habits will change the ability of companies to break through? Do you think it will change the cluster effect that we now have where I think you know, it will. London, London being a cluster and, and, and other areas? I'm 100% convinced it will. And it will because, first of all, you know, you know, you keep probably reading now how even Silicon Valley is quote unquote falling apart. I mean, that's an exaggeration, but basically people moving out of Silicon Valley, right? Because they have realized that, well, uh, you know, at, at some point it just became actually... Um, no longer attractive. There's, you know, almost now, you know, disadvantages appearing, like you know, huge costs and of, of of living in Silicon Valley, right? So, I think as people are starting to move out of Silicon Valley and other big uh, locations, 
uh, first of all, it's kind of distributing the talent, but it's also creating you know, ways of working um, where people are going to be much more comfortable you know, working with other companies. But it's also, you know, like interesting things. So for this biotech company, we're not raising money, right? A year ago, it would be absolutely impossible to raise money without meeting the investors in person. Nobody would ever in their sound mind give you any money unless they met you a few times in person, right? Uh, we are, you know, knock on wood, looks like we've just raised some very interesting money from some really top-notch investors without having ever met these investors in, in person, right? So... You know, and whether and actually, you know, we happen to sit in. I'm in London. They are in London. But uh, you know, some of the in interviews I've had with them or discussions were when I was sitting in Slovakia. Uh, and so, I think in that sense, yeah, indeed, um, I, I'm I'm now very optimistic. Uh, I think the other thing is also that people are realizing that there's now interesting companies coming from weird places. So I don't know if you know it, but actually, currently, the most successful European technology companies guess from where? Uh, Slovakia. No, Romania. <laughs> and so the company is called UiPath. Have you ever heard of the company? No. So it's a $35 billion company uh, uh, out of Romania. They, they just raised a 35, uh, uh, around the $35 billion dollar valuation, right? The fund that invested in it initially made more money than Peter Thiel's fund that invested in Facebook. You know, so it gives you a sense of, you know, because Facebook's actually wasn't, you know, way beyond 35 billion when it, when it did an IPO, right? So, so, and this is out of Romania, right? So it's actually, you know, the best electric car companies, like really, is, you know, where from? Uh, Croatia, actually. Rimac, look it up, R-I-M-A-C. Uh, most exciting electric car technology company. Certainly, the, you know, if, if we discuss, you know, what's the best electric supercar company, it's Rimac, but they also have other technology. So, You know, I think that's another thing that there's this understanding now that, okay, like really cool, exciting, sophisticated technologies can be coming from other places than Silicon Valley or Boston these days. Okay. And you, you think that these habits are here to stay or will this, will you be next time meeting your bankers in fellow bank, the, the, the investors in London when you're both? I think it's here to stay, right? So, I mean, I would still like to actually, you know, see these, you know, see these investors and they will want to see us, we will work. So, Obviously, you know, you still want to have some, um, you know, meetings in person, right? Uh, but I think a lot of the process now, you can just do it, um, you know, and people are very comfortable doing it over Zoom, right? So it's, I, I, it's not necessarily a, a, a deal breaker, like not being able to meet in person. So, and plus, you know, even if you sit in Romania, uh, if you can actually pretty much go through the entire process, uh, you know, or... or, or The advanced up to a fairly advanced stage just over Zoom. Uh, yeah, at some point you go and you um, you um, you can finally fly to London. Not a big deal, right? Or Paris or wherever your investor sit. Right, but, but that is... startup in Romania, that startup in in uh, uh, Liguria, they, they they have a chance at that point. Exactly, and I think the other thing is also monitoring, right? So you know the 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 saying in Silicon Valley always when never invest you know uh, farther than where you can drive in your Tesla uh, uh, because you actually want to be kind of monitoring the company, right? But monitoring the company meant you like you wanted to see the, you know, speak to the founders, talk to the team in person, right? Because there was no other way of talking to people before. You wouldn't talk over the phone. And I think now, again, with Zoom and all these remote working technologies, I think many investors are going to be much more uh, happy sort of monitoring a company, not necessarily, you know, even on, on seeing it, right, uh, in, in person. You probably still want to see the team, you know, once every couple of months, you know, maybe once half a, in a healthy year, in person, you want to be there. But for your kind of regular meetings with the, with the management, I think most people are perfectly comfortable now doing them over Zoom. Right. Excellent. Okay. So two things. One, uh, uh, old is new. And two, distance is dead. Yeah, basically. Very counterintuitive, but, you know, talking about breakthroughs. What, what we're after is all these breakthroughs, right? And uh, so... I think these are the two ones that we have just put our fingers on. Great. Okay. Thank you so much, Martin. Thank you very much, Thomas.